Hi friends. Today I want to talk to you about something maybe we've never considered. That modern man is condemned to his success. That's from Father Jacques Foggy. He's a modern contemporary spiritual writer. He's the type of priest that a lot of priests read. And he wrote this in one of his books, Modern Man is Condemned to His Success. What does he mean by that? Well, I, I, I think two things in regards to moder modernity, to the modern times. It, certainly the secular sense. So for us as Christians, that in the modern times, Christianity is waning, right? And so we're, we're losing a sense of who we are. Even as we continue to believe, many Christians are losing a sense of who God is, a right sense, and how to be in a beautiful relationship with Him. And therefore that affects them, and affects their relationships and what they do with their life. So the secular sense, yeah. But also modern in the sense that, unlike any other age, we get so much of our identity and mission from our work, from what we do. And not just like in the career track, put so much emphasis on, you know, like from schooling all the way through uh, high school, college, or a work trade, and, 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 and then for the rest of our lives. Our, our careers, our, our titles, our accomplishments, uh, what we do. But in, mixed in that too, modern sense, uh, is that go, 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 go. That we always have to be doing something. Okay, so mix all that together. Think about all that together. And in that context, Father Jacques Philippe says that we're condemned to our success. That then so much of who we are and our self-worth and our meaning and our purpose now, getting more and more separated from God, and more and more attached to the, just the rhythms of this world and its culture and what it emphasizes and says is important. And always uh, being fueled by this go, 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 got to do, do, do mentality. And then putting so much emphasis on what we do. And, and by the way, not just work, but also like husband and wife and father and mother and priest. What we do is what we are. When you mix all that stuff, stuff together... If we are not being successful in what we do, then we condemn ourselves and everybody else does. If we're not successful as husband and wife, as mother and father, then we condemn ourselves. Right? If we're not always doing, 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 then we condemn ourselves. And in this world that has become increasingly success, secular and we're removed more and more from God, we're condemning ourselves because we don't have a merciful Savior. God who's patient with us, so we can't be patient with ourselves. And we wallow in our guilt and our shame. Oh, what to do with that, right? In an age where, unlike any other modern age, certainly, we we are increasing our divorces. Our families are falling apart. Um, there's so many people afraid to work today. Uh, there's a rise in suicide rate and our, our younger generations are struggling with anxiety and with fear and with depression like any other younger generation that we've known in modern times. And our, our society is fracturing. All of this is actually related. So what to do with it? Well, you know, like all things, all the answers that we need are in the Scriptures. All the answers that we need are in God, the author of the Scriptures, and in that relationship with God. He can address all of this. And He does. So let's go back. Let's go back, actually, to the beginning to the beginning of the scriptures, to let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Now, before we jump in, real quick, just remember this, that the author of the scriptures ultimately is God, right? Uh, written over thousands of years. 
Old Testament, New Testament. And the ones who he is inspiring to write, in this case the Jews, the ones who then are writing at the human agents, the Jews, they're not so much concerned about history in a linear sense. When in Genesis 1 and 2, God is telling his people, and then they're passing it on in an oral tradition for centuries until it's eventually written down. The Jews, as they're telling their children, they're not so much concerned about uh, historical linear facts. This happened, and this happened next, and this happened next, and so on. They're more concerned about the truth. And the truth is like, like, who are we? Where do we come from? Why are we here? What's our purpose? Who created us? Is there a reason for us? How do we get into this mess? How do we get out of it? Things like that. Deep, fundamental truths. Ancient truths that are ever new and being asked in every generation up into you and I today. That's what the Jews were concerned about. And God knew that. And so he tells them a story in which he's not so concerned about on this day, this happened, and it was literally a day, and this day, this happened, and it was literally a day, and so on. No. He's using Jewish poetry. Now, I don't think stanzas and stuff like that, but poetic storytelling in order to teach truth. And by the way, these are historical truths because God is the creator, and God creates humanity, and we mess it up, and so on, right? There is an Adam and Eve. There is a first man and woman, humanity, who rebels against God. There is original sin. There is a devil and so on. So definitely truth. All right. That being said, in Genesis 1 and 2, in regards to the creation of humanity, what you'll see, you can go back and read it for yourself. I'm not going to take the time on the video to read Genesis 1 and 2 for you. There are three things that man is asked to do. It's labor, love, and leisure. Labor, love, and leisure. And these three things help the man in his relationship with himself, with other people, with creation itself, and of course with God. And together, not separate, they help to define the man and give a man a mission. By man, of course, I mean man, woman, child, old, young, right? You and I. In modern times, we've got that all mixed up and dis dis uh, discombobulated and separated from one another. But not in the beginning. Not steeped in this deep truth. Love. Man and woman are taught to love. First, they're taught that God loves them and loves them so much that in an act of love, God creates them. It's very interesting. We're aware if you've uh, you know, been in a high school religion class or if you've been in PSR, CCD, or if you've been in a college class, certainly on comparative religions, for instance, we're aware that in the ancient Near East, there are other stories of creation. And so there's also, the, of course, the Jewish story of creation, which is now the Judeo-Christian story of creation. But the Jewish story of cre creation is so different than the ancient Near Eastern stories of creation from other religions in many ways. But just, just one I want to I touch upon here. All the others deal with so-called gods. And the way in which Father Mike Smith talks about this in um, the Bible in one year, the way in which God creates, he creates, or the gods create, they create in an act of violence. They create in the context of war. Uh, they create um, in, a, in, a, in some sort of sexual relationship or sexual dominance or uh, a distortion of, 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 of the sexual act, right? This is a context the chaos in which humanity is created, okay? 
And also, they were created, humanity was created in order to um, puff up the ego of the gods. Like the gods were getting their energy from the love of humanity, like they needed the love of humanity. And they were created to work for the gods, right? For the gods' uh, selfish purposes, which, uh, you know, doesn't really matter too much about the dignity of the human person. They were pawns to the gods. All that junk, right? <laughs> which reflects, of course, not God, but how we feel about one another and ourselves and how we treat one another. So gods were truly made in the image and likeness of God, of humanity, should I say. Gods were created in the image and likeness of humanity. They weren't gods. They don't exist. But this is their theology coming from humanity. That's important to remember. Because when we deal with these three things, then we see three different things from the one true real God. Who is, all those other gods are gone, by the way, in history. <laughs> and the God of Jesus Christ is still around, right? Because, of course, he's true. He exists. So labor, love, and leisure, right? In Genesis 1 and 2, we see that humanity is created in an act of love, not in violence and chaos and so on, and created by God, not by one another in the beginning, but by God. And when God creates, he doesn't create humanity in an act of love so that humanity can love him back because he needs that love somehow to exist or to continue to exist or to feed his ego or whatever. He's not a needy God. He's self-sufficient. He's love itself, in fact. We learn Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are already a community of love. And so he's creating another community of love that is capable, made in his image and likeness, meaning above all the other creatures, we have this intellect, we have this freedom, we have this ability to know God and the freedom to be able to choose God or not to choose God and one another and self. So we were created in love. And that's our, that's our dignity. That's our, that's our self-worth is that we are created in an act of love, and therefore we are lovable. And not just by any other human being or ourselves, because in this modern world we struggle even to love ourselves. No, we are loved by the infinite. We're loved by the, 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 the all-powerful creator of the universe and the God who died upon a cross for us. That's our worth. Not our work. Not what other people say about us. Not what we do. That's our worth. We're loved by God. And, and, we're capable of loving other people. And being loved by them. And we find so much then of who we are too in our love for one another. And by that I mean, you know, I love that line where the Genesis writer, after man and woman are created, and standing before God and standing before one another, it says that they were naked but not ashamed. That when we get God's love right for us, then we can get our love for ourselves and one another right also. And then there is no need for shame of my body or my image or even my past sins because of a God who loves me and a Redeemer who redeems me and, and a person who accepts me for who I am because they love me with God's love and so on. Love. That's what defines us. That's our identity. But remember too that on the sixth day of creation, God rests. And then we, we learn, of course, later on when God has to give, has to give us commandments because we've gotten it so wrong. He, he takes us back to that, to that sixth day and, and he says, I'm going I'm, I'm to com command that you rest on the seventh day. Because after all those six days of working, those six periods of creation, 
over, you know, we know from the Big Bang, it was written by a Catholic priest, by the way, that, um, that, that, that the whole billions of years leading up to the day, the, the, the period of time in which we're created, that God commands that we take a day off. And it's not just a day off. We learn that it's a day in which we are called to worship Him. And again, not because He needs it, but because we need it. We need to stop and get off this crazy merry-go-round of life. You know, just turn and turn and turn and turn and turn and turn. Get off of that and take a day to recognize that God exists and to thank Him for all that He gives to us and all that He is and that He's our identity. He's where we get our love from. He's where He restores the love inside of us. He's where we can, are capable of loving other people and being loved by other people. So we worship Him. Worship means, in the Old English, to, to proclaim one worthy of taking some time on one day of a week and making that proclamation. And not just in a private way, but a public way, because other people need to see that we see God as worthy. And that's part of the whole breakdown of the practice of religion, right? Is that there's people in our family and among our friends who are not helping us by showing us that God is more worthy than whatever else we do on one day a week. And of course, it should be every day a week, and it flows from that one day a week, but we get that day wrong, and it messes up all the other days. And so, leisure is important. The leisure of worship, and the leisure of taking a day off from all of our work, not just our careers and our work for money to provide for our families, but all kinds of work. The work of being mom and dad, the work of being husband and wife, the work of, you know, being a priest. I don't take Sunday off because that's the day I'm working for you and God. I take Monday off. That's my Sabbath after the Sabbath. And I try not to do a bunch of priestly things. And an important reason why, and this flows into um, work also, labor, is that if we don't do that, we will fall into the lie just by a matter of practice and routine, rote living, that everything in my life depends upon me. And we live that way. Everything in my marriage depends upon me. Everything in my family depends upon me as father and mother. Everything in this parish, in this school, depends upon me. Everything in my job and where I'm working depends upon me. So we work like that, and we live like that, and then we cave over the years under the increasing gravity of that lie. And you can see how all of that, that labor, that love, and that leisure given to us, and given us together in the book of Genesis, the truth, but lived has to be lived together. But that's all been messed up in the modern world, in our secular age, in our go, go, go. And then finding our identity in what we do. Because today, modern man is condemned to his success. If we don't follow God, if we don't worship God, if we don't... Um, Live our lives as if God is worthy of our love, what worship is. We'll get that love wrong, and then we'll get our identity wrong, and our, and, and our self-love wrong, and we'll get wrong our ability to love other people, and we'll get wrong how we're going to allow people to love us or not to love us, the ways in which they love us in distorted and, 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 and hurtful ways, and, and, and that we do to them. If we get our worship wrong, okay, then we'll get wrong how we love one another. And then when we get that wrong, then we'll start to look for our worth and it'll become our mission in what we do, like our work. 
And then we as man or, or woman, we just put so much into that. And then, of course, when we lose that job or that career goes south or we become confused or our health gets compromised or COVID happens or whatever else, then all that begins to dissipate and fray and fall apart. And then we lose a lot of our worth and our identity and our happiness and our purpose because somehow our work gets compromised. And then we can't rest. We become restless as people. Restless because of what's going on in our love, in our relationships, in our life, in our work, and in ourselves. We don't, and we don't know, because we don't grow up with this, to, to, to honor that day of leisure. That the whole world and my life and my relationships and my work doesn't depend upon me. We live the lie. And we become more anxious and more depressed and more restless and more listless and more grasping. Just like Adam and Eve did. Grasp for something that God said, you don't need to grasp for. I'm going to provide everything in the garden. Don't grasp for this fruit of this tree. You see the deep truth? But do you also see the simplicity of the way back? It is so simple. For you, for me, for us, in all of our relationships and all that we do, it's so simple. The Christian life is so simple. Just get back to loving God. <laughs> Heck, just get back to letting God love you. And, and, and make the choice, follow the commandment if you must. That is your beginning, to honor the Sabbath. And to show yourself and others that God is worthy for you to take some time to worship Him. And give yourself a day of rest that flows from that worship. And when you love God and allow God to love you, then He's going to start to transform over time the way you love others. That you're not just loving them with your own human love, but you're loving with them more the love that God pours into you. And you're going to start to transform the lives of others. God is actually going to do that for, through you. And they're going to start to love you the way that you want to be loved. And you're not going to grasp for what you expect from them or expect them to give to you. They're going to give it to you, but it's going to be so much more than you can ever grasp for on your own. And it's going to totally transform the way you see work and live work. And not just your career, but the work of being a husband and a wife, a father and a mother, a boyfriend and girlfriend work of being a priest, and so on. In the beginning, God created man and woman. And he gave them three beautiful gifts. Love, leisure, and labor. And all of them help define who we are and what we do with our lives. In the modern times, we have separated all three from selves. All three from ourselves and all three from one another. And that's why we're in the shape that we're in. Modern man is condemned to his successes. And if our success is defined by us doing our love the way we do it, you know, human love alone, and our labor the way that the world teaches us to labor, and our leisure by just constant distractions and, and running in and out and uh, pleasures, and thinking that's leisure. No, let all that crap go. Go back to the way God created you. And then you won't be condemned to your successes. You won't need your successes at all. Because God will succeed in what it is he set out to do in you. His love, his labor, and his leisure will completely define you and give you your mission. Until next time, friends.